chemical precipitation over time, another regression test. For hypothesis four, this is looking at whether there's been a relationship between these abiotic variables and leopard shark abundance over time. This again involved a regression analysis. And, hypo and research question one was uh, visual analysis. So looking at whether the trend in abiotic variables tends to match the trend in um, abundance over time. There were some limitations to this data set. Um, so for one, trawling locations were not random. So the trawling locations were dependent upon the tide, which ranges by six feet. It, it, it's the tide, basically. Um, conditions, so conditions in the bay, and also the program length. And so this picture here, uh, what it's showing is, this is the map I showed you earlier showing the area that we're trawling in in the southern portion of the estuary. This is a zoomed in map that I created showing the sharks that we captured in 2017. So the black dots that are here, those are representative of where we caught a leopard shark in 2017 in the summer months. And so this on the, uh, up here in the north is the San Mateo, Dump, San Mateo Hayward Bridge, and in the south, this white line right here is the Dumbarton Bridge. And these X's represent USGS stations. So station 30 right here is where we got the salinity and the water temperature data. So as you can see from this map, we pretty much were trawling in this deep water channel. And so this data analysis, this research is, um, it's, is related to leopard sharks that were captured in this deep water channel. Also, the dates weren't randomly selected. They were based on enrollment in these eco-voyages and the discovery voyages that we'd go out on. And those primarily happened in the spring and fall when school is in session. But they did happen throughout the year. So there were many hundreds of trips that happened throughout the study period. Um, it was a 20-year data set. And so I do believe that this data set is a good characterization of leopard sharks that we caught year-round throughout the study period. So for the results of this analysis, uh, the hypothesis one, looking at daily abundance over time and whether that's changed. So this is including every single shark that we caught from January to December 1998 to 2017. This included 155 hours of sampling using an otter trawl, and this included 303 females and 420 male leopard sharks. And what the screw and rank order correlation test determined is that there was a very slight increase in abundance over time. Very slight. Um, it is a, there's a sporadic increase basically because there's no linear or quadratic trend um, in the data points over time. So there's areas where we have lots of data, areas where we don't have a lot, and some areas where we caught lots of sharks. So there's no uh, linear or quadratic trend between the data points. For hypothesis two, this is looking, the first part of hypothesis two, this is looking at whether there's been variation between months over time. So I ran a Krusko Wallace H test on this data set, looking at sharks, the average amount of sharks we caught in January over the study period versus the average count of sharks that we caught in February over the study period. Um, so variation between months in cash per unit effort. And what this test determined is that Yes, there was variation between months, and over here in this table, this is showing between which, which months cash per unit effort differed. So between March and May, there was a difference in the amount of sharks that we caught over the study period. Between October and June, there was a difference in the amount of sharks that we caught over the study period, and so on. But what this test is really saying is that it's, um, there was no difference in the average amount of sharks that we caught between summer months. So I'm a, I am saying that summer months are the months of April to August, so April, May, June, July, August, there's no difference in cash payment effort over the study period. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to analyze further, I wanted to further analyze my data using just a summer cash payment effort data set because I really wanted to look at when abundance, um, when these sharks were most commonly found in the estuary. And this also, these months, April to August, also fall within the breeding and the birthing season for these sharks. So that's when they're most abundant in the area. The second part of the hypothesis, too, looking at whether there's variation in catch period effort between years. So are there years when we catch more sharks, or are there years when we do it, we catch less sharks? And what this test has determined, the Crusco Wallace H test determined, is that yes, there has been variation in catch period and effort between years. So the years in which catch period effort was lowest, again, during summer months. So variation between in catch period effort between years during summer months. So years in which it was lowest, 2006, 2007, 2010, this is when we caught 
a lower amount of sharks in 2008, 2015, and 2016. This is when the hatch meeting effort was the highest. Last part of hypothesis two, looking at whether there's been a trend in catch and effort over time during those summer months. And a regression analysis determined that there's been uh, no trend in catch and effort over time at just summer months. Hypothesis three is the, um, there are multiple regression tests that were run looking at how abiotic variables have changed in the estuary over time. Um, and this is just in the study period, so from 1998 to 2017. So uh, there, the regression test determined that there was a slight decline in the total precipitation over the study period. There was no noticeable change in the average summer salinity over the study period. There was a noticeable slight increase in the average summer water temperature. And there was a potential slight increase in the average winter water temperature over time. Hypothesis four is looking at how abiotic variables might be influencing leopard shark catch and effort over the study period. And out of all of the tests that we ran, we determined that no abiotic variables influence catch and effort. So this is just showing two of them, the two that had the closest to significant p-values, running those as um, to see whether those are influencing catch and effort, just to see. And uh, no, they, they are not influencing catch and effort. Research question one, the visual comparison. So since the previous test determined that these abiotic variables, at least using this data set, are influencing catch and effort in this region, um, I still thought that there was something that we should look at. So what I did is I created a graph plotting catch and effort down here in the circles versus salinity up here. So this is catch and effort and salinity during the months of April to August over time, over the study period. And I boxed off the years in which elastomobrane die-offs happened in the estuary throughout the study period. So there were three, 2006, 2011, 2017. And while there was no significant relationship between these variables, it does, the, this suggests that something might be going on that the statistics just isn't picking up. And I thought it was just important to see. It looks as, as if when salinity is low, catch and effort tends to be low as well. So for the discussion, um, this study found that there were greater abundances of sharks during the months of April to August, the summer months versus the winter months, which I defined as December to March. Um, this is consistent with the, with the study that was conducted by Hobbs, Cook, and Crane, looking at how leopard, shark, how leopard sharks are affected by abiotic variables in the salt pond restoration, the salt, the salt pond restoration region of the South Bay. They also determined that leopard shark abundances were greater in the spring through fall months versus the winter months. So this study is consistent with that one as well. This study also found that leopard sharks can be found in the estuary year round. So from January to December, leopard sharks were found even though their abundances were different. And this is consistent with that study conducted by Susan Smith, looking at how um, these leopard sharks, looking at abundance of leopard sharks in the estuary. So these sharks are found year-round in this region. The study also found um, that abundance has been relatively stable over the study period despite variation between years. So despite catch green and upper variation between years, uh, abundance has remained relatively stable over the study period. Sorry. Um, there was a slight rise in summer and winter water temperature. There was variation between years and varying salinities, but again, their abundances remain relatively stable. Out of the abiotic variables that were analyzed to determine which might be impacting or affecting leopard shark abundance over time, um, while there was no significant relationship between that, it does seem like there might be something um, that might be going on that our statistics didn't pick up. So when salinity is, decreases, cash and effort tends to decrease as well. Uh, relating back to the literature review, looking at the study that was conducted in Tomales Bay by Hopkins and Ketch in 2003, looking at how abiotic variables affect leopard sharks, and the study conducted in the South Bay by Hobbs, Cook, and, uh, Cook and Crane on how leopard sharks are being affected by abiotic variables in the South Bay. Both of these studies determined that salinity drives um, the, the distribution of these sharks. So when salinity levels are low, catch and effort tends to be low as well in these studies. 
And I believe that the results of this study, they did not determine that, but I believe that the results of this study were influenced by where our trawling took place. So again, remember our trawling took place in that deep water channel. So we're catching sharks in this deep water channel area. And literature has shown that, and those past studies showed that um, when abiotic variables such as salinity and temperature became intolerable, these sharks would migrate out of the bay or um, studies have shown that they also just go to deep water areas so they can escape those intolerable um, shallow area regions. So we might be catching the sharks that have escaped the, the area that they just find intolerable. Um, this study also found that temperature did not affect abundance. And this might be because that study in Tomales Bay, again, sharks left that estuary that day when temperatures were below 10 degrees Celsius. Temperatures never got below 10 degrees Celsius in the study, and they also tended to increase over the study period. So this might be why temperature wasn't an influence in catch and effort. Uh, so it looks like, just from looking at this as well, abiotic conditions and leopard shark abundance tend to fluctuate over time, and it looks like it's fluctuating naturally over time. So this study is a very small piece to a complex puzzle that's looking at how leopard sharks are doing in the San Francisco estuary and changing, a changing climate and changing abiotic variables and development. And so while the population fluctuates and abiotic fluctuations are happening, and while there's been multiple noted die-offs in this area, their population has remained relatively stable. Various elements might be causing these die-offs that this study was unable to determine. So uh, the parasite might thrive under certain physical conditions, making the water really warm, or when salinity is very low or very high, or any combination of factors, um, this parasite might thrive. Also, these sharks, when they go and become osmotically stressed, so when they're physiologically stressed, maybe that's when this parasite is able to infect them or um, infect them easily. So there might see, be something going on there. Also, these sharks are a schooling fish, and from research on how the parasite transmits, it is very common in benthic schooling fishing communities. So these sharks are schooling fish. They tend to um, congregate in the spring to summer months at high density. So perhaps when their density is high, transmission is increasing, and the rate of transmission of that parasite is increasing, and we're seeing more dead sharks during the season as well, when they're in higher abundances in this area. Um, also, on a more positive note, the policies that are enforced by California on the commercial and sport fishery policies, that three bag limit, that 36 inch minimum size requirement, and the ban on bottom set gill nets, that might be doing a job in uh, maintaining the population status as well. So there's very, a lot of variables that uh, we can investigate to understand more about the relationship between these sharks and the parasite and abiotic variables. Uh, but according to this index provided by the Marine Science Institute, it looks like these sharks are doing fine overall, and they are um, not affected by these mass fatality events according to this index. So as for recommendations, um, this study is coming at a, an important time when there's a lot of political turmoil over the health of the San Francisco Bay, and we need continued good science to be able to clarify and explain what's actually happening here. Um, so that we can understand more and move closer to the truth about what's actually happening in this region. While the leopard shark population in the southern portion of the estuary has remained relatively stable over the study period, abiotic and anthropogenic changes to the region should continue to be monitored um, so because they are changing with the changing climate. Also, there should be continued research on the interaction of water salinity, shark physiological stress, and the ability of Miamiensis avidus to infect sharks. Future studies should focus on the size, the sex of sharks, and the sex of these sharks that utilize the southern portion of the estuary at different times throughout the year, um, so that we can understand more about their behavior, their distribution, and their movement patterns, which is largely lacking in the literature. And lastly, uh, utilizing these data that's been collected by citizen science, uh, citizens by employing citizen science tools and applications such as iNaturalist could really help us understand more about these sharks and about a lot of animals in the estuary. Um, these citizen science tools can even offer a spatial analysis tool for scientists who are looking to understand more about how these sharks move and um, let us know more about the ongoing status of these sharks, especially if these dialogue events continue to occur. Thank you for listening. And that's it. Do you have any questions? <laughs>
Um, so, um, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Really great work. Um, and you touched on this. If you go back to the slide that shows the sort of the relationship between so yeah that one okay. So the box the box um, years are when there was reported die-offs, mm -hmm. and um, so you're showing up maybe a little. In the solidity, looks like you know that looks pretty pretty dramatic there. Whereas the change in population from the index does not looks like it's a little something going on, but not not enough to detect. Right. So you did hit on this point, which um, maybe needs to be brought out a little more. Is that perhaps during these years the, the deep water population could they that could be. Um, augmented from animals that are in the shallower regions. So maybe shallower regions would have fewer leopard sharks during those periods. Is mm -hmm. that possible? I, I especially think so. I think that they might be escaping the shallow regions maybe mm -hmm. just because they're intolerable and moving to those deeper regions and we're, we're catching we're catching more then maybe, mm -hmm. um, which might be happening because 2006 was this Really, really, if you look back in like our history here and like our rainfall, it, it was we had so much rainfall in 2006, a lot more than we did in 2011 and 2017. So maybe that affected a lot more of the estuary um, versus you know these years we had you know low salinity but not as low as that year, and then it seems like they've remained. It's been pretty steady and stable, you know, um, up until 2017. So I do think we might be. Yeah. So then let me ask you this. Um, going forward, what additional research would you, or data, would you want to collect to understand this spatial dynamic? I'd like to do, I like how uh, Hobbs, Cook, and Crane, who did the salt pond restoration analysis of abundance over time, they looked at habitat preference. And I think that would be important to look at leopard sharks in different habitats, because they utilize pretty much all of the habitats. They use the salt marsh sloughs, they use the eelgrass meadows, and they use the deep water channels. So it might be cool to see um, which habitats are more abundant in when we have these high precipitation, high rainfall incidences as well. See maybe, like, oh, they're going to this region when rainfall is high in these other areas. And maybe because they're all in this one area, because their habitat has been cut off in different areas, they're more close to each other and then they're getting affected yes. by parasite. Perhaps. Yeah. That's you. a good question. So my, my, my first question is, are you thinking of going on for a PhD? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> that question. Don't answer it. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and the reason that I ask is that um, I think this is really, really a neat study. And I think that you've got an enormous amount of super interesting questions that you've unearthed. And um, I, I, I find myself, seeing you present it, be able to as you know, I'm obsessed with this graph. So are you. I know. <laughs> um, and, and one of the things that came out as you were talking for me is time lags and the idea that they don't even re reach maturity for, um, what do you say, 7 to 13 years for the yeah. males and the females even worse, right? Mm -hmm. 10 to 15 years. And they're case selected and they're, uh, so, so there's they're things that get screwed up in their environment could end up hitting the population um, over time, and so I'm seeing that 2006 drop, and then kind of suppress populations for the next seven to some years, and so the whole question becomes much bigger. And I'm, I'm almost, I'm, I'm wishing that we could do population models. Oh, that's a really good point. It's a lot <laughs> and, and, it's lower here than it was yeah, before. Yeah. yeah, and so um, I, I think it would be super hard to get it through straight data collection, but I think you could do a really interesting population model. And so anyways, questions that are coming to my mind is, do you think that there's um, any, uh, are, are you getting mostly adults? Mm -hmm. Are you getting different age stages in this deep water cavern? What what, uh, what do you remember from the, the numbers? Uh, so we, uh, so I, we caught pretty much a mix of male and female. It was pretty much 50-50. I did a, um, did, I can't remember what test that was. It was oh, one yeah. where you compare 50-50 versus looking at whether this population is, you know, at that 50-50 you're changing. It was pretty much like just equal, male, equal amount of uh, males and females. So 
Um, also, we, I think that other slide was showing, we, we sampled, what was it, 303 females and 420 males or something. So that's oh. just reflective of the amount of sharks we caught. So it looks like we got more male or more females, but also there's all this data that's missing. Like people who no, that more was, males. Yeah, we caught, we caught more males, but there was a lot of data on that sheet that was like people just didn't fill it out all the way, mm -hmm. or they put M, or they put a K or something. Are, are they said. super but sexually dimorphic? Uh, I'm not. Like, like, can you tell easily yes. if they're male or female? Yeah, exactly, you can. Um, yes. So, so from a straight population perspective, <laughs> the that's bad. What I see right there, mm -hmm. because those males are worthless, right? Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. Anyway, I think that this yeah. is far beyond the scope of a master's, and I think it would be really neat to um, to pursue it in the future. Okay, that's all. I do too. Yeah. And I mean, I, I was thinking about the, the die-off results, like the person who did the study from California Fish and Wildlife on the die-off, they found an equal amount of females and males that were affected by it. Um, but I would be really, really cool. How about like pups? That. Are there any pups in that deep channel? No. Oh, oh, yes, a lot of pups. A lot of pups. A lot of pups in the deep so channel. They're, they're, so that, again, oh my gosh. I know. You're going to have to do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, Keep moving other good questions. Yes. Have Kate has a question. Okay, so Rachel stole my biggest question. Okay. Uh, so I want to say that this is a perfect writing sample for the two programs in your area, UCSD and UCSB, that I know are looking for excellent graduate students. <laughs> Another oh, PhD. That, that's yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. I mean, you, can, you could go even uh -huh. beyond. I mean, I mean, really looking more closely at the Southern California, California population, the Northern California population, mm -hmm. and the thing about the deep water channel that really interested me and catching a um, per unit of effort is the CPU was really developed back in the 20s with um, the sardine population, mm -hmm. Francis Clark and, the, and um, the guys down there in Monterey, and one of the things they were trying to figure out was where did the sardines go when they disappeared, because there were no mass die-offs. Mm -hmm. And part of what they came up with was they were just going farther and farther off the coast, and that was reflected in changes in CPU. And so this, if, you, if someone did a study where they weren't trawling the deep part of the bay, they were, you know, kind of, kind of skimming the, the shallower areas. How different this study may have come out. Yeah. Um, and I think there's just so much that you could do with this, and also the question of with um, sea surface rise and sea um, temperature change. That in the future, will these become kind of a keystone species for the estuary? Mm -hmm. um, this is just, you know, I have a million questions and I'll stop the coffee on my way to Southern California. Talk, but <laughs> this was a wonderful study and I just think it opens so many possibilities and so many other really important questions, even though people may not think leopard sharks are an important species, but of course they are. Mm -hmm. And the questions that you can answer in a, in a much deeper study in a PhD program Thank you. Okay, other questions? Questions from the group? I have a question. Yeah. Um, could you go back to where you did the um, the temperature for the water quality monitor? Mm -hmm. Just the location of that. The location, the location and the water. other like location. This yeah. one? Yeah, so I'm actually it would be super interesting because the, the location that you have is pretty much in the middle, like within the deep channel. Mm -hmm. And so not that I'm telling you to go back and do more data and get your PhD, but it would be super interesting if you had um, another uh, monitoring station that was closer to the coast because I think what some of your work seems to be implying is that it is actually the, the rapid change in salinity concentration that might be affecting this kind of more vulnerable population that is coastal in nature, mm -hmm. right? And so right. you could see like some pretty significant variation between your monitoring stations that could just give you additional food for thought. Right, right. well has that been done? Have they looked at, I mean somebody else probably is using this data, right? And <laughs> have that, they looked um, at, at how it varies from the shower and the deep water, the salinity? The salinity? Well, there was, I mean, the study that we used is that, that was really similar in July to this one was looking at habitat preference for these sharks and those variables, so temperature and precipitation in those separate habitats, and looking at whether that impacted or affected abundance. So that study did it. That was just one uh, four-year sample, uh, four-year study over time. 
and uh, but not with the not with the sharks, just the temperature and salinity and how oh, it just, varies. Um, they, I'm sure someone has done something yeah. like that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, this one this was hard because you know Marine Science Institute collects temperature and salinity data as well, yeah. but we couldn't rely on the data set um, because <laughs> of a lot of things. Yes. Like it, it's done by kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I, I kind of. There's got to be someone that's doing um, definitely. Taking yeah. So I think it was just like a question that came up. Like maybe that could answer your question right. in a little bit more detail. And I, I guess the other thing that I thought was was really interesting is just the challenge of dealing with the scale of time. Right. So you were motivated by these die-offs, which occurred over a very short period of time. The data that you have access to, sometimes you have to aggregate it and you say it's like a monthly average or a seasonal average, whereas precipitation events are extremely episodic, right? Mm -hmm. And they can occur over like a half hour or a two hour period. So how do you like grapple with like, okay, this is at like a monthly or this is at a daily scale and then you have this data which actually occurs over like a three or four hour period and then you may have this other population. So I think it's, I'm wondering how you like, how, how did you work through that process? Because it's certainly very challenging. But very challenging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dr. O'Malley. No, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. No, I'm saying you, you helped very uh, helped a lot with yeah. that. Um, it, you know, we I, we tried it. I think in every way that we possibly could. We we really did. We, we sorted the data by day, by yeah. by like by quarter, by month, by year, by like every two years. You know, we we did it in so many different ways and just kept coming up with pretty much nothing. That was, was happening like, over and over and over again, um, and you know the test that finally did, you know, come out with something. We're looking at it by month, like variation okay. between months yeah. and between right. years. And we're okay. finally like, oh, okay. So it looks like you know overall there's some there's you know they're more abundant sometimes and not in other times. And there's variation between years looking at the their abundance, but um, it it was definitely a lot of we tried so many different variations of it Thank and it you. got yeah. exhaustive and. Uh, I think having water quality measurements from a different area might help. And also what we did is we also averaged the date, the, the water quality measurements mm -hmm. from the 43 feet to the surface because oh. they only varied by like 0 0.1 yeah, or 0 yeah, 0.2. Right, right, right. It really, even though it's 43 feet, the variation yeah. was so, and I think okay. it's probably because that high tide and low tide yeah. is not water yeah. up. Yeah. Um, so it, I think we really need to get out of that deep water channel, I guess, to really see the difference. Because obviously, in 12 foot water, you're going to have a much different temperature, and also it's exposed to the to the to the sun when it's low tide and it's like six feet there. Um, so and then the southern part of the South Bay, there's very little tidal mixing, right? right. And so that's like right. another thing that can be a confounding variable that right. you don't have time to. Yeah, you just don't have the resources. <laughs> no. to well, well, and it's not there's no data because it's just. That's what you've got. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah, so interesting. Thank you. And yeah, that's actually one of my other questions: is is does are there other data sets, fish catch data sets that at some point in your PhD you could compare <laughs> to this data set um, from from the angler surveys or something like that? That's why I think the the citizen science aspect is really great because there's a very popular sport fish. They yeah. are sought out insanely by people who love to put up a great bite and they barely take any bait to catch. Yeah. Like I accidentally caught one like a couple months ago. Oops. And so, <laughs> you know, they, and um, because of that, I, I feel like if we use you know, data from, from commercial and, and just recreational fisheries, uh, we could really find out a lot about that too. Yeah. yeah. Fishing yeah. Game has a lot of really good records on catch. Also, Fishing go all, all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century. Fishing data? Uh -huh. Fishing game. Fishing game. Yeah, fish California. Game. Now, fish and wildlife, thank you. Fish and wildlife. Fish and wildlife now. Oh, that's right. Fish and wildlife now. But they have really good uh, records that, okay. that you can pull, I mean, even historic. Yeah. And do they go, would they would they cover every depth with their fish and uh, they would have locations it's by with varying location, degrees mostly. of certitude. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but usually the catch amounts, yeah. the catch numbers, and the locations. Okay. Yeah. Now, a lot of these studies were done, the ones that I have referenced were from California Fish and Wildlife, too. Yeah. Well, these are from Fish and Game. Fish and Game. <laughs> <laughs> a while ago. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, they changed their name, but they can't hide from them. <laughs> But there's a direction you didn't go with this that I think you could put into your discussion that would be, 
dealing with this weird data. Mm -hmm. So 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 I, I know the backstory, and I think that it's an interesting backstory, which is we start out with a very messy data set with uh, accumulated for a different purpose by volunteers, which might be really valuable. And so one question that you really have is, is it? Right? Is it valuable? And so I think that what what you've shown is that yes it can be and that it's limited, but but certainly I think that that's a valuable message is that you do show the dips in the populations in the die-off years. It's it's not um, it, it's not it's not a statistical trend, but it is showing up. Right. So there's a signal there. So I think that in your discussion, talking about that a little bit more, because it was a heroic effort using that data and, and <laughs> cleaning it up. Um, and then try to disentangle it. Right. And I do think it was successful, although it showed that they're more resilient than some, mm -hmm. which is amazing for a case like the Frederick. Okay. Yes. I'll definitely add that. Yeah. I, I have a note of that sort. You don't need to remember. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, other questions from the group? I'm just wondering do leopard chance? So basically, I have a question on the subset question. So, do leopard sharks also get affected? The die-off years uh, are, are they affected by, by contaminants besides parasites, like in the water, um, say mercury level or nutrient runoff? So, has anyone measured that? Oh, yeah. So I wish I could talk. So I could do this for like two hours. I have a whole <laughs> section on just how much how, much, how contaminated they are. Mm -hmm. Like there's very common sport fish, but they have levels of mercury in their tissue that is insane. Um, it's not even, it, like 30 grams a week, I think it is, a very small amount. So think about you catch a five foot shark and you can only eat like a shoulder or something, like very small amount, like little bliss, like you know, you really can't eat much of it because it's so contaminated with mercury from runoff from cinnabar vines and from the gold rush and PCBs, DDT, dieldrin, um, the list of contaminants is insane. And people um, have actually a, a doctor by the name of Davis, I thought it was Dr. Davis when I first got here, mm -hmm. uh, did a study on like how much is in their tissues. And so there's the person who I talked to at the California Fish and Wildlife, Dr. Marco Bihiro, he is convinced that it has to do something with the contamination in, in the water and with these sharks that's maybe fueling their susceptibility to the parasite. Like tuberculosis, it's dormant in your body, yes. kind of dormant, and then like when you get really oh, sick, it comes out. Mm -hmm. um, so some, there's so many possibilities. Like, like probably the immune systems are really weak at those years when there's high contaminants. In yeah, them. and it might be making them have less pups when they're giving birth. You know, like a bird's up for soft shell or something when when they have all the contaminants in their bodies. There's that might be driving population changes. Yeah. Have like heavy contaminants in them as well, or is it like specific 